Right. Um, so, uh, thank you, Philip, for the introduction. It's, it's absolutely my honour to be here uh, talking to you guys. It's actually my first time to Glasgow, um, so I, I probably have some time today just to explore how this beautiful city is and how lucky you are in the Macintosh School of Architecture with this wonderful building. Um, just walking through with Philip, just felt how great to be here to study architecture here with the space, with the spirit of that uh, Macintosh has designed around here and you can feel the energy. And I think today um, my topics of the talk is about life after studio. So um, the emphasis of this lecture, what I'm trying to do is to uh, cross over between the academic, but also the practice work we do at Make Architects. Um, and to talk about how I think the importance whilst you're studying the freedom of uh, being a designer, trained as an architect, but also how does that influence the architectural practice and vice versa. And I think it's really important uh, for us as a profession. Um, so I'm going to take you through that through a series of uh, projects, from build projects, but also for some research projects. Just talk about, hmm, should I press forward? Or, oh, here we go. Okay, got it. Um, this is just an image of what I finished with my uh, diploma when I was a student many years ago. And I still feel very fresh about it. Uh, this is something which I'm so inspired that time. Uh, this, this project is located in Istanbul. And uh, I was still have a really strong resemblance about the idea uh, of looking or those viewings and, and the, the idea of the mosque, these domes. And, and the, it's on the right-hand side, you see this is along the Golden Horn uh, between the Asia and the western side. And you can see the blue mosque there. Uh, I was, I was very much engaged by the idea of openness and the idea of the landscape and the hills, which always been part of me. Um, so I've been studying throughout uh, for the last two years through my diploma. So what I, what I did was I was very obsessive with uh, some kind of cultural experience. And I think culture really reflects what architecture is about. And our society is embedded with um, people's sort of opportunities and the ways evolve through buildings. And what I'm interested when I was a student was that I was interested with how the landscapes was evolved with buildings and also how people generally uh, inhabit in the city. In Istanbul, it's a little bit like Glasgow. It's quite hilly. And the way that people moved around um, was always about going vertically and ascending and descending. So I found that rather quite intriguing to have this idea, how, but how do you actually go there and have a sense of a view looking towards uh, the heritage or the buildings around you that defines Istanbul. <coughs> so what I was doing, I was just really looking into obsessing about designing a staircase um, during my final year, sort of looking into how the views when you are inside a building can be appreciated. The, basically, the context around you becomes your ingredients to become a to design. So as you walk around, it's about walking through these views, uh, looking at looking at the city. And I found that intrinsically intriguing. So after I finished uh, my research at the, for my study at the Westminster, I I sort of fascinated with the idea of the research and and the idea of how does that bridge between practice and the academic side. Um, so I've been teaching at various places after straight after study uh, as a very, very young 
teacher. Uh, this is at the moment my seventh year at uh, teaching. Uh, so, so basically at the moment I am running a studio at the UCL, the Bartlett, and I also practice at Make Architects. But I always think there's always a huge dialogue in between, uh, as an exchange between the practice and the academic world. The reasons being is because the academic world has a lot of energy and a lot of room and freedom to research on the particular topics that sometimes you might not foresee in practice. And, and also, there uh, could be a much more wider cultural uh, response to a particular way of resolving a problem. Um, and that's also feed into practice. First, the practice can bring in is the idea of how does that materialization and the way of uh, how building perceived can be feedback in. And, the, and I always felt that there's, there's always the, this network, this really diverse network that's interlocked together, uh, whereas on, you can see the three big circles that bridging between research, academy, academic, and practice. Um, those can be branched off towards many, many other possibilities, such as research with other institutions, with other specialists, uh, talking to local institutions, and, and also just being the designer, just being, being the designer that uh, sort of respond to the cities. So we make architects, just about us. Um, we are uh, based in London. We, we, we found this practice, uh, actually it was Ken Shuttleworth found this practice 10 years ago. Uh, this is our 10th year anniversary. And, and, and basically it's a very, very energized practice which we believe we, we create uh, sort of architecture for the public. And, and how, the way how we work is to that we break into a studio base sort of systems that it's almost like being a school um, that there's no define of a stylistic approach every project it's about the brief and what the client's inspirations and how do you tackle and to solve that problem and the and the people inside that team will find a solution and evolve with design and we found that uh, sort of intrinsically interesting because Everyone has an idea to feel in what the best idea which comes through will actually put forward. So these are uh, the people. We have about 143 people at the moment. Um, so this is our studio, which uh, was last year at uh, Withwood Street in London. So you can see we are all very, very lively standing here trying to make a smile towards the camera. And, um, and we are very, also very international as well. Uh, as to reflect the diversity of London culture. We are 100% employee owned, which means um, the practice doesn't own by anybody, it's owned by the trust. Uh, Ken has this vision that uh, the practice have a, wants to have a sense of share ownership that to encourage um, sort of people in, in the practice sort of have this a sense of being in the practice have a sense of this identity being has an ownership in itself. So whatever profits that we get from the practice will be shared back to the people who worked on the project. And, and we all, I found that this is a sort of very successful model. Um, so the projects we have is across the globe. Uh, at the moment, we have quite a presence in London and China. Um, and we, we always take on the approach of the sustainability side, looking to energy, sort of trying to find ways to, to respond to the city on minimizing the consumption. Um, so just to talk about in terms of the culture of the way that where we live now, in terms of we're living in this world of internationalism that it's very global that, you know, culture sort of crossing between cities. I want to touch upon how, you know, architects uh, or design or generally cities behave and, and 
how we actually designed through learning from uh, historical context, but also as a way to appreciate um, from the past. And this image I get it, it's almost like a it's a, it's a supermarket. Um, it's it have lots of sort of cans and ready-made products, which somehow you don't know where it's from and where is it? Is it from China? Is it from Africa? Or is it from the local area? You just don't know until you read the label. It's this recognizable internationalism, sort of, you know, in the same way, sort of reflect architecture. That um, does culture reflect architecture anymore? So I want to touch upon that because I think uh, culture has a has a strong presence, and and as the role of architects, we have a a very big role to play. And I just want to talk about the first uh, this project, uh, just to touch on that subject. It's uh, we recently completed a project uh, in London, one of the most uh, famous department store. Don't know if anyone knows the Harrods. Um, it's uh, we we got appointed to look into designing the escalator uh, at one of the halls. Basically, I think this this Harrods has this own sort of historical context within itself uh, since the early 1900, um, and it has this beautiful sort of history of uh, palette of architecture from the sort of very ornate period and to the Victorian and Edwardian, and then through the Art Deco period, and, and then in the 1980s, we got the sort of the American influence of shopping malls, and now with back to the 21st century. So what, what I think what the client wants to do uh, is to our response is how do you, how do we reflect to uh, to this kind of very rich architectural language from the past, and just this is an image just shows it's the first ever escalator in the world, and guess what this is made out of? Um, it's made out of twenty two hundred and twenty four pieces of tough leather that link together. Um, to form and the escalator. And what, it wa what was so interesting culturally that time was um, because it was so novel, uh, people would think actually when you go up there, you will feel dizzy. So when you terminate at the end of the escalator, you get a brandy um, to calm you, calm you down. So <laughs> we, I found that quite, uh, quite intriguing. So our site is located at Harrods, if you look at the plan, the red box indicates the site, which is um, which is a escalator hall, uh, and the image you see it's a it's a beautiful um, staircase led by uh, Louis de Blanc, um, and I think basically this we this is we this is almost like a like restoration project, and also how does it? How does the new and the new work reflecting and complementing the historical uh, heritage? So, so at the moment, uh, not at the moment anymore. It was last year. Um, before our completion, this, the basically the escalator, uh, how it was before, was there was a 1980 insertion uh, from the American influence, though it's got of quite uh, lots of ornate details about the, uh, uh, about the sort of the Egyptian stylistic uh, expression. And then I think what, what's really interesting is that it, you don't feel you are in anywhere apart from you just know there's a lot of ornate detail. And on the plan you'll see that the free session, the, the, blue se the blue session, it's expressing the hall in between. And the yellow is the, it's, it's on the historical <coughs> settings, and then on the on the blue on the green side, you see this sort of new insertion. So what we're trying to do is to find ways of getting to know the building. So we're almost like a his historian, just trying to understand what it was before and 
all the original detail just to look into the clues of what uh, Louis de Blonde did when he was designing and try to find ways to how we actually reinterpret it or make the things that uh, that has that re reflect that essence. So uh, looking on the inside, you have this beautiful frieze detail on this cast iron balustrade with this very, very elegant uh, new po light post. And then go, they've got this travertine light stone along this balustrade. And then on the outside, you will see how the building is made out of terracotta, uh, although it looks very much like a stonework. But the terracotta works has this beautiful uh, scale of vertical detail. And then on the on looking at the details of around the threshold, the window surroundings, you will find there's some kind of bronze element, which is sort of carefully crafted and beautifully executed. And we find those elements particularly fascinating. Uh, so during the process, we all, we almost try to address and do a lot of drawings about the details of um, those every bits, you know, the, the width of the travertine stone. We look at the, the dimensions of um, the balustrade detail, look into the stone, which, you know, the composition of stone, actually, it's, 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 it's really kind of in-depth because the stone, there's travertine, but then there's also there's red pen stone, which is a grey colour forming on the balustrade line. I mean, the architects really think hard about how things put together and how it should be expressed. And it's always about the consistency of integrations. Uh, and also we've integrated the surfaces as well. You can see the sprinkler a little here. It's, the sprinkler system was in, integrated with the, with the freeze detail and the plaster. Um, and, then you, and then you go to see the 1986 escalator hall and you suddenly f uh, felt, obviously there was a demand in terms of uh, the escalator, the, the, the idea of more of a galleria from the American period inserters uh, and it was very popular at that time and some sort of greenery type of uh, sustainability start to evolve. So I think the that time, that period, we felt that it was completely destroyed, the heritage. Um, so what we also un want to understand was it's what defines the sense of the shopping experience. And that reflect you are in there. It's just like you are you are in this school, you feel like you're in Macintosh. Uh, so we really sort of un understand and try to find details about the past. So we actually go into the archive, uh, London Metropolitan Archive, and also various places, almost like a detective. Um, and it's such a joy to, to investigate all these details because um, without knowing it, you, sometimes you walk past it, you just never know that you've touched this detail, you, you walked upon that. Um, so by having the time and got the opportunity to do that, it, it's, uh, we felt it was, it was very, very intriguing. So that this sketch, uh, which expresses um, the idea of this fluidity and the idea of bringing the outside, this verticality uh, of the terracotta expression to the inside, because we felt the integration with the escalator uh, needs to be embodied within uh, the whole space. So what we did in, in here is that this is the escalator hall, and that's the, that's the historical part. We, in, we inserted 16 new escalator, and, and then in between the threshold, we tried to emphasize the height to give a sense of verticality. And as you see some of the visual images, it's in providing the technologi technology as well for the shopping experience. We're trying to maximize um, the opportunity for uh, the visual merchandising, and but also complementing the materials. And the selection of materials, how we wanted to reflect, it's, um, is using the, the notion of metal. So we, 
when looking at outside, it's very much about this co uh, copper detail. So we try to find ways of, so that the entire escalator uh, um, we, pro we proposed was this beautiful bronze detail um, that has this very fluid escalator, uh, so sort of scallop to express this verticality. And then we also want to open up the windows as well to provide natural daylight. As you can see before, it was this, this very ornate type of um, glass that it was just, it's, it was not, not very welcoming. But what we wanted to do is to maximize natural daylight to give a sense of, as well as give a sense of orientation. And then by expressing, by tapering um, the windows, the light can actually flood down to the to the lower ground to give us more a sense of a depth. And in here, on we looked at um, you know look at the historical detail of the ceilings and uh, you know just talk about ceiling details and looking at plasters that uh, during the kind of the Art Deco and the Edwardian period, the plaster work had. Uh, it was rather sophisticated in terms of the patinations, uh, and we want to reflect that sense of material, uh, that sort of expression, but using a different type of materials. So we initially we were proposing to use a uh, copper freeze detail. So it's it's almost using the press technology to express this rather intricate pattern um, to create a sense of a place that holds between the old and the new. As I talked about it, it was this, we observed this detail from outside um, Harrods, the window display, this really beautiful bronze vertical. And we, and, and I think the sense of scale, how we translate it, it's, it's borrowing some of the scales that term uh, from, from the outside and bring it into the inside to get this kind of very fluid, um, dynamic sort of experience for the traveler to, to get to un get, get to feel with the form of the outside. So, so, and I think what's, what's really important is that what we found is that the entire building needs to be completely integrated with services, um, services such as fire alarms, uh, sprinklers, CCTV cameras, I mean all these very Men, what we so call the mundane but very essential uh, equipment needs to be com inter uh, sort of integrated. So what we design is to just define a series of zonings that allows us to uh, integrate that, but also for forming sort of easy access, accessible area for them. So, so this this metal sort of ceiling zone, uh, you can see there are four of them, and in between these are the zones that has this integration of services. Um, so I think architects, as a designer, needs to be aware of this. And I think, you know, we generally don't these days. Um, if you look at a lot of buildings, so it's not just about how I felt, it's not just about the envelope of, of the building. It's not just about how the skin performs, but how the interior, all the other small elements that you don't normally think about Actually, they are very important. Look at the ceiling here. The ceiling here, you have other fire alarms and other um, kind of sprinkler systems, which later added. And you can, as you can see, they were. It wasn't Macintosh design. If Macintosh were designing it, I, I, I think he he would do it a completely different way of expressing it. Um, so, talk about integrated details. It's that. Every bit we actually designed, almost in, in using a, the health and safety uh, sort of design, we have to do it. Uh, this is some of the design we would do with the balustrade, but also in between these escalators, um, these pram guards. So we, we all, rather than have a proprietary product, which you can buy from you know, off the shelf, we, we think it, it, it should be part of the language so we've got this bronze profile, um, which you know, embedded uh, and encasing with the glass, and then at this really beautiful sort of ear detailed 
And the reason of this detail is because you have to respond to the uh, escalator uh, glass and then also the, the width of the, uh, of, the of the travel rubber that, that holds into it. Um, and also, you know, tiny little details what you don't see, but actually, you know, most of the escalator, you will see this plastic element hanging between escalators for health and safety. But, you know, this is so important. So we, we also designed it when we observed the, uh, the old ones and general escalators. They don't tend to have these sensibilities. And I think this integrating this, it's, uh, it's, it's really, really important. So this is a view looking uh, from one of the uh, gallery levels towards to one of the shopping uh, area. And as you can see, the material just really flowing the, you to it. And you can you feel the texture uh, between the stone and the metal. So we went to the manufacturer. And uh, these are some of the first early studies um, with the bronze, with, with the copper profile. So this is made out of copper. You can see this fluted detail, um, which is were inspired from the, uh, from the external cladding. And it was very, very shimmering, sort of copperish. But then once we put that into the bronze bath, there's some very, very magical sort of expression. Um, you'll read these. So this is a this is a mock-up that we did um, prior to the in, uh, sort of construction of all the escalators. Is that the profile itself? It was really thinned. It, uh, but also it because the copper is very kind of allow you to to manipulate with the profile. So we have the two tooling machines to to bend the pro uh, to bend the um, the copper on one direction to form these flutes, but then another tooling machine to bend it to form this wonderful belly. But what's really nice about this is that you see this in between the bending, you see this really beautiful uh, sort of lines of the copper, which I will show you more later. And this is the, some of the, uh, this is the, um, the uh, Porto Bay stone. Uh, with the ventilations, which has this very the sense of vertical verticality, which expresses on the walls, which also complements the escalator. So this is uh, which this was uh, taken uh, only a, about a week ago um, by in-house photographer Sander. Uh, he this is from the outside. You can see you know Harris of the out, and then the inside you can. Just, start to feel this kind of continuity of the bronze and 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 we felt when we when we saw that it was like we felt quite emotional about it because it's it's what we was before it was you can't really see inside but now you can really engage the inside and the outside people from the inside looking on the outside the staff actually felt really proud using this staircase or this escalator um, and then looking at the language, sort of, you know, the old and the new, we found that uh, rather beautiful. And this, this is looking from from the cafe, looking through to the glass. Uh, you've got the Georgian wire glass, uh, which is which we, which was listed. So we had to uh, repair it. And then you've got this fluted detail. Uh, it's rather nice. The other one is. Um, it's on the roof level. The roof level, we did a, rather than having a normal sort of sky lantern, we want to challenge the design by, uh, by sort of re, sort of reinvent uh, thing. What is the, the, the roof light can be expressed. So we we work with the uh, manufacturer really hard in in terms of. Getting this fan detail, almost like an aircraft. Um, they've got this taper stainless steel joint, and each joint you have to. The, there's a there's a glass in between, sort of pieced together, and and then at the end, it's almost like a palm tree, and you can see this beautiful glass uh, at the skylight level going in, sort of welcoming you to the top. Um, 
So this is where it is now. Um, you are sort of walking to the entrance, looking through, uh, sort of embraced by the um, by the escalator. And this is looking from the landing side. You can see the sense of height, the verticals that, um, and the materials that reflect from the natural daylight. And then the people, that's really sort of, you f really feel the movement. Some of the details looking through, uh, some of the bronze and the copper bronze, you can really see the lines coming out through and then also uh, sort of terminating to the ceiling. And then this is some of the details that you can see. Um, this is quite dynamic. And, um, and also another detail there. So we, it's, and finally, this is something which uh, we've been working with uh, a glass, a uh, very well-known glass bloke called the um, Chihuly, who, uh, who is an American artist. And uh, basically, he uh, designed this glass chandelier for us uh, in the hall. So this will be installed within, within one of the ceilings at the ground level uh, to welcome the public. But what's really interesting is the material itself, uh, when, it, when, it's, when it goes to the store, sort of this metal and, and, and stone, and they have this exuberance of, um, of materials that, you know, sort of this really beautiful sculpture, uh, and uh, quite looking forward to see it. So this is still installing, it's in, this is, this is in Los Angeles at the moment, and they had to disassemble every piece and then ship to London and assemble it back. So it's a, so it's there at the moment, but they're putting it together, ready to be opened in February. So we are very excited about it. So um, the next project, which is on the pipeline, it's uh, just going to hit very briefly. It's we've we because I think Harrods is it's trying to. To sort of reflect the importance of the heritage, and and also renewing the technolo technology for uh, future customers. Um, this is a, a project that we're working on, still on drawing boards. That um, uh, it's going to be a suspended lift, sort of ex in the in one of the space, which um, I can tell you a lot bit more when next time I see you, or when you go to Harrods. But this space, basically, it's, a, it's an elevator, which is within this very confined uh, Wardian staircase, which we are restoring. And this lift will be sort of entering this uh, to have a sense of vertical experience of, of the Wardian staircase, but also have this very intimate experience. So, after just talking about a project um, uh, through practice, and I just want to touch upon a little bit about how uh, the studio operates, uh, and then how how does that really affect or there's a dialogue in between practice and academia. So I've selected a few projects just to uh, tease out some of the conversation. Uh, so this is a project uh, based uh, student. Uh, uh, you that are uh, based in Venice, and what I found these these projects are intrinsically interesting is that there's always uh, a play into culture. That uh, sometimes it it could be quite playful. Sometimes it it was through the tectonics that the structure came through. Uh, so he was very interested in the idea of artworks in Deutsch Palace. So if you uh, if anyone been to Venice. Venice is it's, it's a water city. Uh, it's almost which is embodied by the veins of the, these river and canals. And and there's one public space which is at some St Mark Square, which a which is a huge public space. And he was very interested in promoting the public uh, engagement towards this space. But he's also interested in sort of these art artwork which is inside the gallery and then he, he 
we having had the conversation with him uh, over the course of the year, and he realized during his unit trip to Venice, he realized actually there's a lecture, a lot of uh, sort of replica uh, around. Sort of imagine uh, Canaletto, one of these amazing painters, painting the um, Venice. You will you will probably have uh, quite a lot of these painters uh, selling replicas along in uh, in Venice. And then he observed this cultural phenomenon, how to sort of express this uh, to enhance a public experience. So he was very interested in the idea of this art movement um, by introducing the idea of replica towards into a public space. So he, he basically started with uh, thinking about sort of dissecting the one of the the buildings in the Deutsch Palace, how this, because he was very interested in the idea of uh, movement, the idea, and, and the, the, the frequency of the density of this piano wires. So he, 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 then, he, then, he then tried to think, oh, how does that work? Maybe if the, <coughs> if the stone opens itself, then at, at a certain time, you will actually experience um, the artworks appeared. So he designed a sort of art studio and also art exhibition space within this public space. So what it does is that this is the existing Deutsch Palace. He, he redesigned it so it, it accommodates uh, sort of this artist can live and sustain in this building, but as well as storing this amazing art pieces um, that, you know, lots of paintings of the Canalettos and also paintings around Venice, um, and these paintings would sort of distribute out for a public view um, during sort of day, you know, and, and it's such a, such a joy to watch because in, in, in Venice there's a sense of, you know, flooding and the reflection of the, of the waters, and then you get, you get the sense of the space between, you know, the, the the galleries and then the paintings and then you got the you got and then you got the main sort of chapel there and the, the the historical context is so rich where he's also fascinated with the texture of the paintings um, so that's that's you um, the other project which I also want to touch upon is it's the idea of materialization the idea of making because uh, we found that uh, having have the sensibility of these materials and the way of experience tactility uh, is the way of doing designs. So Rodolfo was very interested in the Venetian glass. Um, the Venetian glass was was almost like a lifeblood for uh, for Venice because it export uh, because people generally from all around the world heard of um, Venice. It's, it's the place to make glass. So he went to he went to Murano to learn about how to make glass in in, in, in in Venice, and he made this quite interesting sort of glass pieces. He, at that time, he didn't know what what it what it was, but he he tried to have this kind of this sen movement sensibility that also create this terrain that sits uh, on this glass pot. Uh, there was started with a transparent glass and then started to play, play with colors and then and then this is it's then kind of this sensibility evolves that he decided to design a glass blowing factory um, for the and then you can see its buildings almost has that presence of you know the furnace has the presence of the, um, the terrain that this landscape evolves through uh, through through the, through its architecture and then, and I, and I think what's what's really interesting is that the, the material transitions from glass to, to to the drawing board, but also consistently testing the materials and making the presence of the models. Uh, it was it, it was quite interesting. So it's it's quite a fluid space in the sense that it welcomes you um, from the river, sort of. And then this this is the, the space where you do all the sort of firing and um, glass blowing. And this is sort of celebrating the idea of um, blowing glass. And um, 
not a joy to watch. Um, the other one, which is another one that's also in Venice, is that uh, he was very interested in the idea of movement um, and how the, the idea of the stairs evolved. So this is the Deutsche Palace. Uh, so he went in really thoroughly studying the Deutsche Palace, how that's the, you know, you've got the window openings, that the threshold, and he was just very fascinated about timber. Uh, how does the timber, sort of using gulam lam to construct a staircase to create this quite sensual experience. Um, other projects such as uh, in London, which is quite recently, uh, I think what this, our students want to try to address is the, the cultural influence and the current contemporary culture. This is a project, it's about evaporated university and sound sounded like we, um, basically it's, it's, he was fascinated with the idea of the virtual reality and people can actually learn from online. Um, and spaces in London that are fairly limited. Uh, and, and he was proposing this idea of a park where this is where people correlate once every three months for a cultural dialogue and knowledge sharing platform. But during the daytime and nighttime, during any other events, it acts as a public space. And, and the idea how he expresses is that the landscape, it's almost like a crafted landscape and, and the whole canopy itself sort of scattered around the cities forming this quite calm and uh, this ambient space around here for, for visitors and just locals to enjoy the park. And I think this is something uh, he was very interested because he found that London generally, the public space, uh, the lacking of public space for people to use is it uh, uh, needs to be addressed, and uh, but and then he, he he sort of did it in a rather sort of intriguing and quite quite expressive sort of for his type of architecture. So so the the ones that the evaporation sort of expresses through his sort of sense of the canopy that feathers across the entire site, whereas the spaces are completely embedded within within the gardens. And I think there's another cultural uh, sort of dialogue between in the city, such as in London. Uh, this is the student who's very interested in population and age. Uh, London, as we all know, uh, the populations of old people uh, or elderly people, it's increasing. And But however, the idea of a sense of a place for them had, has a role to play. Uh, it's not been addressed fully. Uh, so he was very interested in addressing these issues. You know, what uh, for having the topic about crossing generations. So he went to China actually just to understand the other culture aspect of it. And going to Beijing as a unit trip, he understands that the cultural value actually is that. Um, there's a very family-driven values to it, where there's a there's a diagram that the old would always, you know, can look after the youngs and 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 the basically the mothers of the of, of the childrens can also look after the the elderly, and but this types of models uh, hasn't really ha it's it's not culturally embedded within the Western. Uh, sort of area. So he wants to bring that across uh, into his building program uh, by having a sort of an, a nursery center for both uh, elderly and young children. And he's, he established this brief by then thinking about how do you use the space. Um, so he's, he's, he designed this rather uh, sort of landscape sort of typology where the landscape becomes almost like a hill for for social engagement between the elderly and the children, and and design with emphasis of the landscape using soft carpets, almost like using rubber as a very soft texture to reflect 
the sensibility of children's getting, you know, making sure the children's safety, but also elderly safety. And then I think the design response then tackles these problems and becomes part of the architecture. And also thinking about the height of the children uh, versus the height of the elderly, and and investigated how those elevations and the ways of how those evolves. And and Alpha was very interested in the playfulness of the slides and the ways of of gardening and and I think the 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 architecture really um, uh, has that sensibility. Um, so just so these are some of the uh, projects that uh, I sort of talked about. And but what I also also want to talk about is that. Um, we, I also think architecture uh, should be for everyone. And uh, just touch upon with uh, Philip and Amy just through lunch about um, people engaging with architecture is that not many people can engage with architecture because uh, it's, it's not something that they know. And we, so we uh, make and uh, UCL and the Open City uh, uh, having this platform of allowing young children to engage with architecture. So we as make as a practice uh, sort of spend some time, spend a lot of time with young children, 16 from not a very privileged background, to allow them to engage what architecture is about. So this is a sketch from, from a student, uh, Moin, about a day-to-day -day life, just about sketching. So he was really just sketching a the you know the, the metro card holder. It's rather beautiful. He was very expressing the idea of this pieces. And and then he, he wasn't sure what he was doing, but then he he wants to design a public space um, outside the square at our office and and he also think you know I he also has this quite rebellion to convent to day-to-day -day architecture about the shape of it, the form of it, your questions. There's a lot of sort of un curiosity about the outside world and the unknown. And he wants to, as, as sort of quite young as he is, uh, he wants to explore and try to visualize or find ways of expressing. So he designed these seating spaces for a landscape. and. Uh, and these seating spaces, you would say the shape, it's very fluid, but the shapes was based on how he was sort of start painting the landscape of how people moves around in the um, in the square. And then you think, and then we we were having a conversation. Why don't you try to, you know, visualize, think about how the seating space or seating would allow you to engage, you know, having just. As, as simple as having lunch or talk to each other, or so he he, he then um, you know I was so amazed by his ability and his braveness of not being scared of uh, doing something. So he he basically he, he drew this landscape and quite fluid, um, almost like a painting, and then he extract these sort of paintings to form this series of seating spaces and forming this enclosure. He, he always thought, he told me that he he wants to have a different ways of looking at chairs and and then here you go. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of future for uh, for the architects uh, for our profession but I think what's really great for us to see is that there's um, we widen the opportunity for others to see what's out there. Um, so finally, um, I'm just going to touch upon our recent projects in China. And I just want to address, you know, because we talked about quite a few small projects and, and maybe we talk about maybe a project which is a slightly bigger scale, but then not so big than uh, we but what we really want to talk about is the sense of the narrative, the culture. And, you know, this is Beijing. Uh, you've got Stephen Hall on the left uh, in Beijing as well, not just in Macintosh. <laughs> um, 
And then you know, the, the idea of internationalism, and again, it, it sort of starts to overriding the world. It's almost about who's the star architect or, you know, who, is it about that or, or is it, or I think it's, it's more about intrinsically how this, you know, culture, people almost moving around. You will see what's amazed, I was amazed by when I was in China a uh, lot two years ago. I, I heard two Westerners having a Chinese conversation, um, a very in-depth China political Chinese conversation. And, uh, and, and I was very intrigued by the change of, of time that the city evolves. Um, so, so the project I'm just going to touch upon is it's a, it's a project that we are doing currently at the moment in Chengdu. It's a, uh, so Chengdu is a city where it's in the center of China. Um, and then it's one of the cities uh, by the government saying this, uh, they want to invest quite a lot of capital in uh, to promote the city's life. Um, but what's, what's great about Chengdu, it's just a sense of life uh, that, you know, first time being there, also seeing the social, the socialness of it, it's amazing because they love sort of social gatherings uh, during the daytime, they might sit in, in the courtyard having a general conversation or just being there, do readings or... And then at night time, they would go out and do public dancing. Uh, that's, that's great for pandas. And then um, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of life out there. So with this rapid urbanization, um, we, uh, we were appointed to look into one of these area to for a hotel within this large complex of a city uh, almost but there's a there's a really beautiful temples which is a cultural heritage it's it's the Darcy temple and then and then you can see within around is mostly sort of this j jargons of masonry buildings and business offices building are eroding from you know sort of dominated the fabric in Chengdu. And we, we try to think about a narrative of you know, the experience of a hotel. What do you, how, when you go inside, how do you feel you are in China? And the way of bringing out some of the Chinese elements that you don't see in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think that's just some architecture has that magic to express. So this is the Darcy Temple. Um, on the right side, you see, you could be any sort of housing in in China. Um, so this is a site. This is a beautiful temple. Uh, uh, it, it is now being forming the main entrance of our hotel. But the first time being there, uh, Ken was actually went there very first time, and he, he saw this very lush of greens. Uh, in the site, it's this beautiful sort of vertical of very light, lush, and felt almost, you know, you're, you're not within the city. And the idea of this garden hotel was very much on the first instance, just felt it was right uh, to form as part of the concept. Um, so looking there, and because of the surroundings, which is surrounded by sort of quite urban cities, and then you've got this amazing temple on the left. So by, by also inspired by the idea of the courtyard, um, having a social space, people can engage. Uh, courtyard generally in, in China has a sense of this openness within this quite intimate area. And we, but by, by Using a different types of scale, we try to form this experience within a very holistic but very calm and private uh, experience for visitors actually generally being feel relaxed within within the hotel. So the idea of the courtyard within the courtyard um, forms what in, forms the concept. But also we we looked into um, the idea of these. 
Chinese landscape. There's quite beautiful there's cascading sort of steppings, uh, natural beauty. Um, and we want to bring this to, to express in the buildings for, for people to feel you are within this very gradual mountains of, of greens that you, know, you can enjoy the views. You, you can basically sit down, have a cup of coffee, that you, you, when you are inside the hotel, you don't feel you are in the hotel. Um, so in the plans, you can see these are some of the diagrams just illust start illustrating why we, the, the green diagrams start illustrating the greens, how it formulates. It's how it formulates a space. These spaces sort of reflected the, um, the programs what, what on the out, on basically there, there are two levels. One is the garden level and the other one is the level below it. So we, we started to make the, this conceptual model. This is the entrance of the, uh, the temple house. And then you can see this these gardens, um, this landscape, have this lots of little, little uh, natural daylight aperture for you to capture natural daylight to the, to the lower ground. And the lower ground, each one of these has its own program. For instance, this one formulates a swimming pool. And then this one formulates, for instance, a function room for... So you, you, when you are when you are at the at, at the base, you always get a sense of daylight there, and I think this, and then you can see, and then you've got two different types of courtyard for social gathering. So the public can now always access within these gardens, so for them to enjoy, but also forming quite a private space within this quite complex area. That's the plan. So you entered from here. And then you've got this staircase going down, and this is forming um, the, the, the hotel entrance that it greets you up to the hotel rooms. And then these are the hills which are forming these courtyards, as you can see here. So this model, uh, initially forming this, you can see the courtyard and those little hills. And then I think what's really interesting is that the embracement of the building is sort of becoming the, uh, the shield, shielding from the public um, that people can actually enjoy uh, the privacy and, uh, and basically just being, being inside to have a sense of a, a, a sort of silence. And then I think we worked really hard on this. It's in construction at the moment, and uh, the way of the landscape that you know inspire from the from the mountains. And how do you translate that through uh, materialization? So, so we worked with uh, local manufacturer and landscape architects to evolve this staircase, which forming one of the main entrance of the stairs. So you can see this is. When you go down, you have this bush hammer stone, which is quite texture. You feel you're inside uh, of the ground, which is the earth. Imagine you are entering to the soil, and then it's welcoming, and then you always get a sense of daylight inside, and then you look up, and then basically it's a ceiling forms part of um, the important part of the architecture. And that's, the, and that's the inside as you go down. So that's the swimming pool, that's what I talked about. And then these are, each room has its, has its own natural daylight. Uh, and the variation of the daylight uh, will varies. And there's a, there's a joy of light sort of you, you experience. And, and this is one of the illustrated views showing the swimming pool, looking, gazing out to the portal of the light, you get a sense of reflection. So it's, it's this quite calmness of space, uh, but also very beautiful, and, uh, uh, and we look forward to see it. And at the moment, it's, it's this at the moment. Um, it's, so by, by looking at the scale, looking at the persons there, we just realize how uh, sort of big it is and, uh, 
and we, we look forward to finishing this project. And, um, and it just very touch upon the outside. And the outside, uh, this is the, the outside of the building. Um, the idea is, is we want to reflect the local culture. Um, so we investigate uh, about the culture of the society. And we find out that um, in Chengdu, it's famous for embroidery. Uh, Chinese embroidery has this amazing history of um, making very delicate fabrics. And when you go to, uh, we went to one of the silk manufacturers have this amazing sort of weaving machines. And the weaving between the outside and the inside, outside one's face could be showing a landscape and then you on the other side you would see a panda. And then we felt, how that possible? But uh, but we felt that this idea of weaving uh, materials feels almost like a fabric, but also using local culture of bricks uh, become, became a key part. So we use local bricks to, uh, to and look in this elevation, the idea of this weaving uh, expression. So we started off with this perforated bricks. Uh, so so the, the public uh, at the ground level will be able to see the views of you know the cafe, the, the public areas, and as you go up where you have the hotel rooms and you've got the privacies, and you know the horizontality that's sort of disguised by the weaving quality of the bricks, um, which just oppose bit in between uh, these two, and then at the top is the, um, you, and then you go back to the perforation of the brick where we have the, all this, all the plant rooms which we need to accommodate and. Um, so we're quite looking forward to see it because we deliberately want to make the illustrated view very different to what we do it in the real thing. So um, we look forward to see the result of it. So that's that's where we are at the moment. Um, it's building up fast. So so very lastly, just talk about uh, two little research projects we did. I did with the students, and um, it's. This, this project is a, um, we are very much interested in the idea of fabric, um, just this intricacy. So, um, and uh, what we found that the collaboration with the students, it's, it's actually has a lot of freedom. And uh, so this is a, a little project we did for, a, for a, for Rome. It's, uh, it's called the Threads of Rome. Rome. It's a it's a fashion pavilion, um, which um, which is about the idea of temporary structure. How does that? It, how can that um, be manifest quickly, but also in a, in a manner that it, it manifests the idea of fabric? Because in in, in Rome, what it was before be, uh, Rome, the Colosseum, the site itself was proposed that time they said there's a huge sort of canopy embodied the entire landscape almost like a canopy and then it was a myth but then we thought that myth was quite an interesting metaphor and we we wanted to express that in this catwalk so 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 what we did is is a is a is a it's a carbon fiber structure it's almost like an antennae that can be extended forming this framework and this framework have this threads of uh, fabric across, forming this quite an interesting kind of geometry uh, as a catwalk canopy. And then uh, there was a art designer uh, and a fabric designer we worked with, and um, sort of specialising in fabric. So he came across this geometry to, uh, for the students to analyse. And um, so this is one of the illustrate view of a section showing you know those structure being extended forming the nodal points allow you to fan out these beautiful uh, colorful fabrics um, forming a stage um, allowing you the catwalk to be a sort of uplifting experience um, and just very lastly is just uh, uh, one of the student also I thought is is just having a conversation about you know the idea of 
gardens and sort of bridges. And uh, this project is it's in France, it's in Paris. This, this, she was very interested in uh, sort of this idea of garden in the city. So this Trifaga bridge at the moment was very run down. But he saw this, she saw this idea of uh, trying to bring in the, uh, the sense of locality. So lavender and, uh, and lily and, uh, was one of the heritage um, sort of plants in France. So it's almost like a lavender farm and garden that embraced the, um, the Eiffel Tower, forming this beautiful garden, uh, and, um, and also forming the bridge for generally for people to, uh, to use it uh, and to experience this Parisian life. And that it's, it's, so I think what I'm trying to address is that the research uh, and, and the practice has a has an intrinsic sort of relationships and and I think um, and I think what we we want to do uh, as, as architects is just to try to push this forward and to promote uh, design and uh, and I hope you enjoyed uh, what, what I talked about today and uh, thank you